you're just um, dreaming that those of you in the wings might just want to come. Yeah. Um, Reunite. Yeah. In the spirit of AU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's make it a real union. <laughs> It's why you're just sitting very much in the wings, if you could take up a little more, um, yeah, or just move a bit more, so that we can see you. <coughs> All right, so you're welcome back uh, to this um, session. Fortunately, there are two speakers, and um, that makes the evening lighter and possibly faster, as much as possible. Um, and then uh, we have uh, two speakers. This is panel three, um, empowering youth, cultural heritage, values, and ethics. And then I have as speakers, um, I will introduce the speakers just to make it uh, faster for them to launch straight into their presentation. Um, we have Miss Irene Tamajong, and then Dr. Pius Adesomi. Uh, Miss Irene, Tamajong set up and directs the African Institute for Mathematics Sciences, AIMS, UK office. One of the key advancement chapters in the AIMS Global Network. With vast experience from the private sector, she made an effective transition to the development sector, contributing significantly to the rapid growth that AIMS is experiencing. Prior to joining AIMS Nelly, she was a product analyst and manager at Pershing Limited, a BNY Mellon Company, and Barclays, respectively. <coughs> Irene holds a BSc Honours in Applied Economics from the United Kingdom, an MSc Marketing from the University of Manchester, also in the United Kingdom, and an Executive MBA from Cars Business School, City University, London, UK. So she has um, a very strong um, academic background from the United Kingdom. And she has joined us here this afternoon um, to make her presentation. And um, also the second uh, speaker is my friend who almost invariably happens to be the first on any list because of, our, because of his last name. <laughs> uh, the first on most lists. And my colleague at uh, Carlton here, uh, Dr. Pius Adesomi, who is one of Nigerians' contemporary leading public intellectuals and highly sought after keynote speaker um, he is a professor of English and African Studies at Carleton University, Ottawa, Canada, and a widely cited commentator on African affairs. He has lectured widely in universities in Africa, Europe, and North America, and has quite an impressive credential that we might be spending a longer time trying to push through. But uh, significantly, he has worked with uh, prestigious platforms such as the Stanford Forum, where he has given talks, and then the International Leadership um, for a platform of the University of Johannesburg and the African <coughs> Unity for Renaissance series of the Tabo Mbeki African Leadership Institute and the Arts Institute of South Africa. He has also um, been affiliated with the African Union vision and I think uh, he's in a better position um, to highlight that in his presentation. And um, his area of focus has increasingly also been in um, youth culture, um, social media, and uh, different popular forms of political engagement. I think uh, we have quite a formidable panel too. Now, um, how do we say, we used to say two man panel or two women panel. <laughs> so two person panel. Oh, that's a more inclusive term. Two, we have a formidable two person panel and very much balanced, or almost, except for the moderator. Um, so you just minus me, and you see that we have the gender balance right on this one. <laughs> okay, so you're welcome, and we are glad that you've um, you had to stick around to be part of this panel, and then also towards uh, the formal closing of this event that I'm already loving that we must have. A full of, um, and then we'll just leave it at that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being a wonderful audience today and participant audience at that. I will now turn over um, to our first speaker, you know, to make her presentation. So, shall we welcome her? Thank you very much. Is it on?
you know that in the continent, um, we don't just clap, we actually spray money to shop. <laughs> so you're doing the cheaper one, you know, spending on, you know, since you're spending dollars. And I think it should be more generous with the applause. <laughs> yes. You want to spray? Thanks very much, <laughs> Professor okay. Can you hear me okay? Is it on? Okay. So, um, Your Excellencies. Sorry, you might just get in closer to the mic. I hate standing at the podium, so I, I tend to move around, so I might have a problem. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, Your Excellencies, distinguished professors and guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. And I thank you very much. I thank the organizers the Institute of African Studies, the Diplomatic Corps, the African Women Diplomatic Forum for putting this conference together and for inviting AIMS, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. I'm here today to... I say that's what happens with mathematical precision. Yeah. <laughs> You need, you need new batteries. <laughs> so I'm <curious> 20 minutes. <laughs> only 20 minutes. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. <laughs> Well, at least this proves this session hasn't been recorded. This is live. And in live presentations, you should expect anything. So anyway, that just before I carry on the thirteen, I'm just hoping that because there are just two of us, we are not sub subject to the 20-minute rule. We're actually, we're actually happy that there are just two of you so that we can finally gain time. <laughs> okay, so I would like to talk to you today about um, advanced applicable mathematical sciences. Um, I was very interested listening to all the presentations this morning, the keynote speeches and everything. And the focus, as we all know, is on the Agenda 2063. Mm -hmm. But as the day wore on, I was a bit puzzled and a bit worried because I didn't hear anything about CISA. I'm not sure if anybody knows what CISA 2024 is. Quick show of hands, just let me know if I need to expand on that. Okay, I see a, a couple of hands going up. CISA 2024, very briefly, is the Science, Technology, and Innovation Strategy for Africa. And this is the first 10-year phase of implementing the Agenda 2063. And I guess it's not by accident, it wasn't random that they said, oh, let's get things up here. I think, oh, maybe that was the, the whole idea there, <laughs> to, to fill up the panel. But I think somebody must have heard about the work of AIMS on the continent what AIMS is doing with the youth, empowering the youth, and building scientific capacity in Africa. And so they thought maybe we should come along and give a perspective of how we are contributing towards Agenda 2063. So if you allow me, I would just like to spend just a few moments to reflect on the sort of Africa we know, or the sort of Africa we often hear about. Disease, poverty, malnutrition, poor governance, you name it. But the only reason I'm talking about this is just to set the framework to see how change is also happening in Africa. And two very quick things, I mean, the pattern this morning has been stories. So I have two little stories to illustrate this. When I was going to school, I'm doing arithmetic, as we call it in primary school. We use slide rules. I don't know if some of you may know what slide rules are. But a lot of children these days, they just have calculators. Some even take their laptops and tablets to school. Change is happening. My father, for example, always used to tell us, you don't know how lucky you children are. I used to walk for miles to go to school because there wasn't one year where we lived. And when it came to going to college and university, he walked for two days to go, and, to go by the river to find a boat to cross over to Nigeria because he grew up in Cameroon and from Cameroon. And he went over to Nigeria to attend uh, the technical college and then on to the University of Ibadan. So without giving away how old I am, <laughs> we can see that from little stories like this, which a lot of us are familiar with, 
Africa is transforming. And this morning, the speakers have been really eloquent in highlighting the aspirations of the Agenda 2063. So I wouldn't belabor any of those points that, that were raised. But like, what I would just like to highlight is that this transformation we're seeing in Africa is, I'll, I'll just pick three things which, have, which can account for the transformation. There's the economic growth, which the High Commissioner eloquently you know, explained and put it in perspective that as we consider Africa as a whole, even though there's been this growth, it hasn't always filtered down to the rest of the population. Having said that, there is some progress and things are improving. What I would like to spend a bit more time on, after just going very quickly through the um, economic, uh, uh, economic growth, is just highlighting for this purpose that back in 2000, the average per capita GDP was about $1,000, and these are World Bank uh, development indicators. And by uh, 2023, when the, uh, the statistics were taken, it had doubled to $2,000. Now, if we look at the impact of technology, and this is the one that I would, spend, I would like to spend a, a little bit more time on, surprisingly, because it's kind of connected with what we do at AIMS. But technology has been a big um, transforming agent in Africa. And I'm just going to hone in on uh, the smartphone revolution, mobile broadband penetration. In Africa, as you can see, is leading the rest of the world in terms of mobile broadband uh, penetration. So a country like um, Angola in Luanda, they've laid out the latest 4G mobile phone network. And Rwanda, in Kigali, you have free Wi-Fi across the city. Now, this is a real success story. And without going back into too much history about what, ha what happened in Rwanda, we are all reminded a little while ago only 20, barely 20 years ago, there was the genocide, which was really destructive. Destroyed people, destroyed the infrastructure. But one benefit when you are a late comer is that you take advantage of the best. And Rwanda today can boast high technology, very good infrastructure, and they're really setting a role model for the rest of Africa, for those who are still lagging behind or dragging their feet to really get into the development space. So a quick example is um, the money, mobile money transfer. And in this case, I'm using the example of m -Pesa. This has also transformed the lives of a lot of African people, especially those in the rural areas. Now, the, the good thing about this is it works with very, very basic technology, very basic Nokias. I remember the first Nokia I had was a really chunky, mm -hmm. chunky kind of Nokia. Mm -hmm. But this is all you need to operate this, this um, innovation. And people in the villages can easily transfer money. Rural farmers can send money to their relatives in the city to procure seeds for their farms. Likewise, families in different parts of the country can easily send money to their family members to go buy health care or medication, etc. And this is really spreading across our countries and countries like Kenya, Ghana, and even Cameroon. They've got more mobile money accounts than the bank accounts we know about. Again, thinking about demographics, which is the third key factor I was going to talk about, we, talk, we heard a lot about it this morning in the presentation, so I'm really going to go over very quickly, just because it just has some relevance, and it's just some of the things which we just need to be thinking about. 15% of the world population today are African. If you just take a look, I know we are here at the Institute of African Studies, and we're talking about youth empowerment, the convention, this con uh, conference was convened by the African diplomats and everything is African. But please just take a quick moment to look around the room. And you see that most of the people are already African. So by 2050, 25% of the world population is expected to be African. And of these, 25% again in, by 2050 will be age 18 and under. So we're actually looking at the youth. But here's one statistic that's really interesting and which we really need to ponder about. 40% of this youth will be African. But I don't know if you're noticing something. Europe, Europe is shrinking. It's almost disappearing. Now, what this is showing us, and this is what probably uh, Agenda 63 is picking up, 
we have a collective future to build. The, demograph the demographics present a challenge, but it also pre presents a huge opportunity. It presents a huge opportunity for African youth to take advantage of this change, this renaissance happening in Africa, to make sure they're well equipped for the future that's to come, for the Africa that we, we want. So just trying to highlight again um, the, the sort of future we're, we're looking at is, is really about we want a peaceful Africa, we want a prosperous Africa, we want, a, we want an Africa where the youth, the Africans themselves, really take on control of their destiny. And so STISA came in to really focus on the science, technology, in, uh, uh, innovation aspect of it in the ten, first 10-year phase, first ten year phase of this 50-year plan of the Agenda 2063. But this is where there's a strong alignment with AIMS. The African Institute for Mathematic, uh, Mathematical Sciences, the name is not by accident. It's because we sincerely believe that mathematics or mathematical sciences are fundamental to every aspect of society. So if you are doing any kind of science, you need, you need these mathematical skills. Even in government, no matter what you're doing, you, you need mathematical skills. But somebody was asking in the audience when we had one of the presentations and said, are we going to have a common language? And somebody outside in the audience during the break and say that Africa, you say, is so diverse. How do we unify? Mathematics, we get students who are a Pan-African pan network of uh, centers of excellence. We get students from all across Africa. Some of them come from Anglophone-speaking countries. Others, others come from, uh, from uh, Francophone-speaking countries. The one language that they all understand without too much intervention is mathematics. So... <coughs> I'm not sure what I touched there. Mm -hmm. you know this one? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you. We need to innovate something more user friendly. <laughs> so in talking about STISA, it's really a good, a good opportunity for me now to just give a very high overview of what AIMS is all about. So I was just joking with um, Blair earlier on and saying, okay, you know, I was sitting through this presentation, I heard nothing about STISA, what was going on? Is that why we were invited? So let me take this opportunity and just at a very high level tell you what, what the model is <coughs> AIMS is. We are contributing to mathematical sciences we have three pillars. The first is the training, the actual training of, of mathematical science, and we do that through a structured master's program. And the students come in with a first degree in mathematics or any of the mathematical sciences, and they graduate after a year with an MSc in mathematical sciences. But AIMS also has a unique model in that we are Pan-African. Currently, we have represented 42 of the 54 African countries. We've got students who have come from 42 countries and, you know, from different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. And that we maintain with every intake. We try to make sure it's, it's very diverse. And we see that as going a small way in trying to unite the bigger Africa because people start forming links, they start forming networks, they start getting to know people from other areas. Also, we have world-class voluntary lecturers. This is really significant because at AIMS, the reason it all started was that there was a recognition that there are so many talented uh, Africans that they lack opportunity. So how can we start stemming some of the brain drain of those who have the possibility of going abroad to study, but provide world-class education in Africa to students so they can be empowered, they can have scientific skills to start taking control of some of the institutions that are in Africa or become entrepreneurs. So the second um, pillar for AIMS is the outreach, the public engagement. Again, this is really important because whilst we are a, a, a tertiary education institute, 
We also recognize that in order to get good students coming through the Ames institution, we need to make sure that from primary school, secondary school, the education is such that it molds the children and it opens up all subjects to the children. So children are not scared of doing maths. I grew up in Cameroon studying maths, but even the teachers, they, they seem to spend more time with the boys because they sort of said, oh, girls, you know, go and do home economics. <laughs> you know, boys can do math, so if you're not understanding, don't worry your head too much. These are the sort of things we grew up with. So we grew up with a fear of maths. But AIMS is proactively trying to change that. We have the um, school enrichment program, we have the teachers training programs which we are introducing, and the whole idea he started slipping me pieces of paper. The whole, idea, the whole idea is to teach much in a much more innovative way, to make sure that all pupils get interested and they can make choices based on what they're interested in doing and make, make choices based on their abilities. Those are really important. But the, the last pillar, which is really crucial and which is really in alignment with uh, STISA 2024, is the, is, is the research. Already, AIMS has been in existence since 2003. But the way we have been looking, considering mathematics as essential for development, we had already been covering some of those science and technology areas that STISA uh, 2024 um, was looking to, to, to develop in Africa under the Agenda 2063 plan. So just three areas I'll point out very quickly. is biomathematics, which is applicable in health, financial mathematics, and then cosmology, which is applicable to space and the universe. So one quick example where AIMS in a little way is connected that is significant is a very, very prestigious project, which you may have all heard about it, the Square Kilometer Array. What this is, is it's an international effort to build the world's largest radio telescope. And the in the first phase, South Africa and Australia are leading the first phase of this project. But the component that South Africa is looking at is up to 80% African. So they're looking to roll out a lot of this project into a lot more African countries. Another great opportunity? Definitely. And in the South African uh, Research Center, the Ames Research Center in South Africa, we've got a professor, Professor Bruce Bassett, He's the head of the cosmology department, but he's also a subject expert in big data and machine learning. And he recognizes that big data and machine learning is absolutely crucial and directly relevant to this, to this project, to the SKA project. Can you imagine the amount of data, billions of data, that the SKA will be churning out? We need scientists to be able to analyze it and make sense of all that data. So, just a quick summary. Um, since 2003, we've graduated 748 uh, students from 42 African countries, and 30% of those are female. We currently have five centers of excellence across Africa, in South Africa, of course, Senegal, Ghana, Cameroon, and Tanzania. The plan is that by 2023, we should have established up to 15 across the continent to make sure there's enough, there are enough institutes near all the, the students of Africa who can attend one, but essentially to build scientific capacity. We need homegrown solutions for home uh, challenges, uh, for challenges in Africa. Very, very quickly, um, this map just gives you a very brief idea about what our alumni are doing. So I'll just highlight on three. About 32% 30, of the alumni at the moment are, doing, are following on with their PhD, they're doing PhD programs. Some are doing uh, master's research into various subjects, but about 28% or so are teaching in other African universities. So they're already imparting this knowledge to, to, to students in Afri other African universities. But if time permits, I really would like to show, share again two short stories of two of our alumni who have really been doing great research in, in, in sciences. The first one is a Nigerian chica, and she graduated from in South Africa in 2010. She won the 2013 prestigious L'Oreal UNESCO um, Women in Science Award. Currently, 
She's at the University of Cape Town doing her research on robotics and mining. So we heard earlier on about Africa. Africa is endowed with a lot of resources, mineral resources that are all buried under the ground. But while Chica was in Ames, she took an interest and said, there's so many accidents in mines. A lot of these multinationals are interested in extracting all these precious metals. But did people really stop to think about the safety of these people who go down the mines? We had a the lady who talked about a lot of the, the men leaving Lesotho to go and work in mines in South Africa. A lot of them, unfortunately, had accidents in mines and everything. So what Chica is trying to do is to use robots to send them on the ground for pre-safety inspections before they start sending human beings down the mines. Another alumni we're very proud of is from Cameroon, and this is Antoine. Antoine, I say we're really proud of because this is an initiative which in conjunction with the Robert Bosch Foundation, AIMS is trying in a way to reverse the brain dream Africa has been suffering over decades. And what are we doing here? We've, in, we've introduced the Arete pro, uh, Junior Chair Program. And what essentially it is, is try to get researchers who are working abroad in the diaspora to bring them back to one of the AIM centers, install them as junior research chairs. They can carry on with their research, but more importantly, provide role models for the young ones coming through AIM centers, the young ones who are also undertaking research. And these are just two examples. Think about it. We've got 748 alumni today. A lot of these students come to AIMS. Part of the selection, they have to articulate. They have to motivate why they want to come to AIMS. Because we give all the students a full scholarship. We don't want finance, uh, financial reasons to be, uh, to, to, to be used as a, an excuse for a student not reaching their potential. So their commitment is to say, when we, when we get this education, and really explore what we can do with mathematical science. We want to be able to give back to the continent and build the continent. So I'll finish up, excuse me, <laughs> I'll wrap up by suggesting that AIMS definitely embraces the agendas 2063 and certainly have already started implementing uh, STISA 2024. 20, 20, so three things I would just like to highlight to leave you with is that AIMS is actively stemming brain drain whilst contributing to Africa's higher education landscape. AIMS is participating in global STEM discussions like this one today, but also like the Falling Walls uh, Conference at Berlin uh, last year, as well as the World Economic Forum, which took place in Abuja April last year as well. And finally, AIMS is also enhancing the quality of primary and secondary education in Africa through the teachers' training program. So a call to all the youth, the African youth, is to say, this is the time to step up to the task and make sure you arm yourself with enough knowledge so that this time round, when this renaissance is happening, people are talking about Africa rising, we actually define the future we want for Africa. We actually are active participants in shaping the way the rest of the world looks. I thank you very much for your attention. I, I know um, being <coughs> one who presents a lot to the one trick that presenters use to, to buy time is just to keep saying finally, finally. finally. <laughs> <laughs> or you finally. No, I mean, um, it's, it's um, the, the presentation she had just made is part of the reason why uh, the Institute of African Studies at Carlton has uh, besides some called faculty about 50 cross-appointed professors. Uh, the conference, one-day conference we are witnessing today demonstrates the, the interdisciplinary nature of our, of our studies. Um, this is mathematics. I, I, I kept feeling guilty you know, when I was trying to give a paper because, can anybody guess? <laughs> because I'm horrible with, with figures. <laughs> And um, I was like, oh, this doesn't look like because um, you're not comfortable with what she's doing in terms of figures, you know, then you're being hard on her. But seriously, I wish we had something like Ames, you know, when we were growing up. Um, I have since seen uh, living in North America uh, with my daughter's work, that the way math, math can be taught in a way that will be more interesting 
that some of us who thought that you needed special talent to walk through math um, is something you can actually practice. And so, um, and I'm also happy to see that is a woman who is presenting this in the light of the kind of presentation, the kind of framework she has set up about how young women, how children, um, the girl child oftentimes loses out uh, from socialization process as a child into thinking more about the, um, into nursing or without necessarily denigrating any of those ones of home economics uh, rather than thinking about engineering and math. Um, thank you so much for bringing to our attention the fascinating work uh, you are doing to promote uh, the figures. Again, uh, we are blessed in this panel because there is a striking balance between science and the humanities um, with you uh, demonstrating um, the critical importance of this to the agenda um, development that we have. Um, on my left, we have a man who works with words. Um, who is a poet, a writer, and um, who can also be an explosive commentator. And so the balance, you know, uh, fits in very nicely to our agenda for the conference, and it's a good way to um, end this conference today. On that note, without much ado, I would like to invite Dr. Fires at the summit to this presentation. And then just before he makes the presentation, I want to add I want to add that I am now under more pressure so that um, I bring him on the time and be sure that there's gender gender parity in this in this panel. Thank you, uh Nduka. But who is timing the timekeeper? <laughs> in the interest of democracy and, uh, and justice and fairness. <laughs> Um, I, I did tell um, Irene that, so this is warfare, that um, my presentation is going to be about the clearing war on, on mathematics and, and numbers and figures and stuff like that. So I'm glad that um, Nduka already gave a hint you know, of, of, of what's going to happen because we are both um, from the same generation of handicapped, of, of mathematically challenged <laughs> writers and artists. Uh, who are therefore hostile. <laughs> but um, I want to stand on two existing protocols. Um, the first being the, uh, the protocol of all the previous salutations to the house, because if I, if I was going to do it um, the Nigerian way, I would spend the next two hours recognizing and thanking everybody here and then talking for five minutes. Uh, so I stand on existing protocol. And the second protocol being the one, um, the one established by Your Excellency, you did say that the preamble should not be part of the. <laughs> I think I'm too tall for. I find myself bending. No, you're too forward. Oh, okay, okay. I can project anyway without the. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I want to thank you all for 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 being here. And um, before I start, I, I think I, I you know, it's, I'm, I'm so moved now, so impressed, so fired up by what we've seen here today that, um, um, first, please a round of applause for, for my guest. Uh, we are all good. Uh, no, I'm being selfish first. I'm going to that. I know that we have partners. So I, you know, I'm being, <laughs> charity begins at home. And then to all our partners, you know, our bad partners, the African Women's Diplomatic Corps, and then the, uh, the the diplomatic corps at large. You know, this is this is just wonderful. This is amazing. So please let's be generous with our applause for for all the. You know. And and I, I do want to make a very strong pitch for a repeat performance. You know, we have established this platform, and please, Your Excellency, let us let us continue. You know, let's. The, the institute is your institute, so please let's let's um let's make sure we have a repeat performance next year, and the year after, and the year after, and grow this important partnership between 
an academic unit dedicated to the course of Africa and members of the African Diplomatic Corps here in Ottawa. In favor, say yay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't have been making this, making this call and this speech uh, because I'll be succeeding Blair as the director of the institute. It has nothing to do with that, I, I promise you. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I'm holding here um, is a think piece entitled um, African Union Agenda 2063 Towards a Cultural Agenda. Towards a Cultural Agenda. So initially I had meant to present this to you, you know, or at least take from it and, and talk about it. But then I decided that um, it would be better for me to tell you the story of how this think piece came about, you know. So I'm going to proceed through a bunch of anecdotes, some of them connected, interrelated, some not very connected, but um, yeah, so beyond the jokes, beyond the lighthearted nature of the story of this think piece, what I would expect you to do is to think seriously about what I'm saying, the deeper meanings and arrive at something I'm calling the predicament of culture. The predicament of culture in Africa, the role and the space that we are called culture when, I, when we are thinking these days as stakeholders, as people with a stake in the future of the continent. You know, what do we do? With, where has the role and the space? I know that in the African Union agenda, you know, number five and all, there's, there's some kind of nod, official nod, towards culture. But beyond that nod, uh, whatever finally made it as culture, a cultural agenda, in, into the final version of that document, there are issues in terms of our understanding of what that culture is, where we are going with it, and what role it even ought to play as we move forward as a continent, as a people, and all that. So I want you to think about that. Um, this piece was actually commissioned by the African Union itself. In the build-up, in all the build-up, Your Excellencies, I'm sure you're aware, uh, the agenda, you know, three or four years leading to it, a whole range of consultations, meetings, uh, the African Union was really all over the place, you know, uh, technical groups, you know, inviting people and having people, you know, the all stages of drafting and all that. And so it happened that um, I was in Ghana. It's two years ago now. Okay. So I was in Ghana uh, as a visiting professor, you know, uh, spending my sabbatical at the University of Ghana. And I get this invitation from the Secretariat in Addis Ababa, you know, we want you to be part of the cultural agenda of the African, African Union Agenda 2063, you know. And so I was very excited, oh yeah, that's cool, you know, when are we, when are we meeting in Addis Ababa? The, those of you who are familiar with the organogram of the African Union, I'm sure you know the, the, the CEDO, you know, the, headed by my friend Jimmy Adisa, the Directorate of Culture and Diaspora and, and, and whatever, so so it's a, um, you know, the, the cultural agenda and CEDO, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of putting it together and we're having a series of meetings. So the first meeting you're going to attend will be in New York. We are, we are convening the first meeting in New York. Um, so, so well, okay, we started preparing for it. Then it occurred to me, wait a minute. Didn't you just say that I'm going to be part of a group? thinking and drafting and, and working on the cultural agenda of Agenda 2063. Why aren't we meeting in Addis Ababa or Accra or why are we going to New York for, for this meeting? That was my first hint of, <laughs> of a problem. Because by then, by this stage in the conversation with the Secretariat, they had zoomed into some kind of list of invited, of invited scholars that they were bringing. So you know, it's an email they were sending to me in Ghana, some some top scholars in Kenya, in, 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 in you know across Africa. Everybody is coming to New York, and we are going to meet with our 
diaspora kith and kin and we'll sit down in working groups and all that. So I send this email. Why are we not having this meeting anywhere in Africa? And that's when some of our African brothers and sisters started, hey, speak for yourself. What kind of nonsense is this? If you don't want to go to New York, that's your own problem. <laughs> okay. So, so I took it that, okay, everybody, everybody, so I looked at the list and found out that, um, you know, all these scholars, you know, I was the only one actually not based in Africa. So everybody wanted to go to New York and I, I was sort of a party poor. So, okay, let's go to New York. On my way to New York, I get, what? <laughs> On my way to New York, I get another, I get another community email from them saying, say you're going to you're actually going to do a keynote you're actually going to do a keynote because the way we have structured the new york meetings is that um you know there will be working groups for one week there will be about 60 people and um you'll meet 8 a.m to 5 p.m every evening there will be keynotes and working sessions, keynotes, working sessions, keynotes, working sessions. So each keynote speaker has 20 minutes and then you break up into groups and at the end of one week, you come up with a paper that's going to Addis Ababa and would be part of the final draft, you know, in the culture entry. So I prepared this. And then we got to New York. And then what was the situation? Of course, I had a room full of people in suit and ties, you know, people, you know, of course, from the diplomatic community, from the international development community, World Bank, IMF, never mind that whenever I hear about World Bank, IMF, and Africa in the same bracket, I migrate, I get migrates, right? So, so the IMF, the World Bank, international development community, European Union, this union partners, the people who call development partners in the country. Everybody was there, suit, tie, and everything. And they came with their figures. They came with their figures. GDP, growth, charts, you know, taxes, where's he got to? Taxes, charts, growth, index, you know, you heard all, and we would spend the whole day listening to figures. You know, Africa, Ghana, Africa rising in figures. Ghana rising in figures. Angola rising in figures. All the charts in this world. Mathematics, everything. <laughs> <laughs> you start wondering. You start wondering. And then, and then, of course, all the keynote speakers who were going to, who had figures and data and statistics in their, in their suitcases, they got their 20 minutes as keynote speakers. Then finally, they called the culture person they had brought from Accra. And I was told that I had five minutes for culture. <laughs> that is what Africa thinks of culture. I was told, and they were as brutal, vicious in timekeeping with culture as this man is this to me. But I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to tell it no matter how brutal you are. Because it is serious. So, Oba, you have five minutes to talk about culture. So I protested, I said, And you have five minutes. <laughs> you cannot bring me from Accra to come and do this kind of thing. If I said, ah, you know, we actually, in two weeks' time, we have another meeting, you know, still on the African Union agenda in Dakar. So you can come and spend more time. Just do five minutes. So I did five minutes of this in New York. I got to Dakar. Lo and behold, Another five minutes. This thing has seen around the It's been in five minutes presentations for two years. You have to be five minutes. <laughs> so wait, but wait, wait, wait for this. Wait for this. Then last year, last year, uh, because um, President Becky has this African unity for Renaissance thing he does with Aisa and all that. So they bring me to do the, the keynote last year. They bring me to do the keynote last year. And when, while I was in Pretoria, on on that mission. The people at Birko, the foreign affairs there, they heard I was in Pretoria. Oh, and because Anish through an Oh, you can't come to Pretoria, you have been trying to speak about cultural agenda and all that. Maybe you should come to Dirko and give us the presentation. And okay, this time around, this is the foreign affairs. So I went and all that, and you know, they were very generous and kind with their time and all that. But after I finished 
I finally was able to present it beyond five minutes. The first question was, um, beyond all this culture and all that, don't you think that what Africa needs now is science and technology and, and all this culture? And, uh, <laughs> and after South Africa had been to almost Ten, throughout last year, I practically lived on the plane where international development partners and all that, NGOs and all that, will be having all these meetings in Europe and Africa. Hey, uh, Prof, come and address us, culture and all that. It began to dawn on me that where the continent is going with culture because when these people have finished all their, all their figures, all their growth, all their indices and all that, just before they go for coffee, coffee break, then they will say, Pass, come and tell us about Johnny. <laughs> so they see culture as entertainment. They, they see culture, the, the development world, the diplomatic world, they see culture as entertainment. Come and, you know, come and enter. What's happening now? In, what's it? You know? And that is it. So I, I have begun to, to think critically. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do in my last 10 minutes. That I, uh, <laughs> you have, you have that, three additional minutes. Okay. <laughs> no, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see the mathematical person. You know, that this attitude, this is because everywhere I go, I tell them, I say, look, if you don't can't think beyond a space for culture. In, in, if you can't think beyond the perfunctoriness of it all, by putting culture in the agenda, but you know, so you don't even know, have any idea what that culture is. If some of these kids we have in the diaspora who are calling themselves Afropolitans, they're calling themselves Afro Afropolitans because they have no critical connection. They're changing their needs. You go to Vancouver, you see all these kids, Chinese kids, Korean kids, they are born here, never been to China and all that. They are writing their names in Chinese calligraphy and all that, and they are connected. When they open their mouths to speak English, 100% Canadian. When they speak Mandarin and, 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 or Cantonese, 100% Chinese. But these African kids, they, 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 are, they are writing African names. You should see what they do to your urban Igbo names on Facebook. <laughs> You pity the continent because they're calling themselves Afropolis. There's you because there's no base that is being presented to them uh, to identify with or to connect to. So Afropolitanism is floating there with that idea of something out there that was root, but there's no critical connection. So if you don't take this seriously, you are wasting your time with all these figures. And why are we not taking it seriously? Is this we have not thought through the critical linkage between science, innovation, and culture. All our policies in Nigeria, I came of age at the time when it became an official policy to privilege what, what Tony Falola calls the criminalization of the humanities. Official policy, let's privilege science and technology and mathematics and all that. If you want to do history, literature, and uh, and uh, that's fine. And learn what it is optional and all that. And everybody was encouraged. I was beaten because I was gyrating towards literature and all that. And I would so it's 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 we haven't thought through those critical connections. And I'll give only one example of how culture drives science and technology and innovation, and why we should pay attention to it. It's a good thing that we see cars here and all that. Cutting edge cars and all that. But we don't always think that the reason why 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 Toyota Nissan, the reason why Toyota Nissan and all these car models where they go, they send people to the market to sample taste. What do people want? The car of the future. How do you know how are people's tastes? Taste. What you consume is a function of your culture. So taste is what drives innovation. It's what science responds to. When, 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 when you eat kimchi here, the Korean loves his or her kimchi. When you eat kimchi here, and then you go to Seoul, you discover that it's not the same thing. It's not exactly the, the, the taste. That's because some people somewhere in Korea thought, wait a minute, when we refrigerate kimchi using the standard modes of refrigeration, 
something is lost. The consistency and all that. Maybe we need to domesticate the science a little bit, the science of refrigeration, and make sure that it's able to keep kimchi in conformity with our cultural tastes. The French people, the allez, allez les bleus, les francophones sont ici. <laughs> oui, excellence. So, <laughs> look at the history of French haute cuisine. When, when we first started going to France and all, she, she was in Francophone. Eh? <laughs> when the, the French, all oh, these North Americans and their fast food culture, no self respecting Frenchman would think anything of American gastronomy. It's, 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 it's barbarity, McDonald's and, and all that. Here you want to eat for, for have dinner for, for, for 10 hours. 10 course meal and the proper French haute cuisine and all that. You want to do that. So they had garlic content for the fast food culture. Only to discover that that American culture fast approaches to everything is dictating culture. It's the second culture. That is why you've got Twitter. Fast, it's fast food information and all that. So all of a sudden, every time I go to Paris now, I notice that French haute cuisine and all that, it's no longer 10 hours. They are having to make, you know, they still do all the good things. Things have changed. The sociology of, of the dinner table has changed. They still pretend to have this day for North Americans and their fast food culture, but the philosophy behind the fast food and how it is driving science, culture, and technology, and behavior is beginning to affect, you know. So it, 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 these things are connected. But then we think that it's, 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 it's a joke. It's a joke. So people have got to have what to live. You've got to understand that. And that's, that's one thing I, I've been telling our partners in, in Addis Ababa. The African genius, which Kwame Nkrumah wrote, as the, as the, you know, people always think that that essay, and I advise people in Ghana, your excellency, I told people, I said, I'm not, I'm, I don't even understand why this essay is not in pamphlet and compulsory reading across the continent, the African genius. People always think that it's just the, the address you gave while, um, while, um, while uh, launching the Institute of African Studies in Accra. But he wrote it earlier. It was part of his conceptualization of the dream of the OAU. And everything goes, his discussion of science and innovation and technology, everything goes back to culture. So why can't why can we now say that we want to we want to do Africa 2063 another another 50 years and then we treat culture as entertainment? So we have to make uh, a case for that. One, one final thing in New York, and this is the most uncomfortable part of my, of, my, of, my, of, yeah, <laughs> of, my, of my presentation. I wasn't particularly happy in New York when after one week of work, <laughs> after one week of work and labor and all that, um, we were finally told by the African Union delegation uh, in New York, uh, yeah, well done, you know, you've done this, you've done that, and we hope we can count on you for future work and all that. And I've told them I promise to stop criticizing you. I'll keep my mouth shut so that these invitations don't run dry. I enjoy the, 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 the flights and the trips and all that. But I wasn't happy when we were then told that the final document I will be presented to the heads of state for ratification. I said, what? What? If, if I have written in this document about, about the threats to governance, good governance in Africa, which you have there, and you are saying longevity in office is a problem. And then somebody who has been in office since 1960, you are going to give it to him in, in, in Addis Ababa to come and ratify? What? Are you kidding me? If I say corruption is a problem, there is, I've spent the, the pretty much the last five years fighting a particular government about, about, about his monumental corruption. You're going to bring him to Addis Ababa to come and ratify a document condemning cor corruption. <clears throat> so I said, I don't understand why those who have been responsible for vitiating the dreams of the continent in the last 50 years should be the one to preside over the document saying that we are going this way or that way in the next 50 years. So they have to... <laughs>
Quiet, let, let me tell you, this is why they only give you five minutes on your speeches, because you do take 20 minutes. You don't know mathematics, do you? <laughs> All right, um, having to caution about time makes me look like a hangman. You <laughs> are. But um, we, we have to, it's been a very lovely day, and um, we just want to help us to end on a, on a happy note. So that we can all go around. So, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to restrict the, the questions to one minute each, so that we will um, avoid another kind of um, lecture. So, if you're going to make comments, I will plead with you to kindly keep your comments short. And then, if you have questions to answer to ask, please uh, make it more focused so that we can wrap up. Uh, we have. I'm glad that we're still very African. We have some very distinguished high commissioners and um, who have left everything they have to do. And we also have our colleagues who have traveled out of town so that we can bring this um, to a close with um, with the remarks, the closing remarks um, from the vice dean of the African Diplomatic Corps. Um, if I had my way, I would also say that. Um, would like to add maybe a minute. It's difficult to get people also from the African Women Diplomatic Forum, you know. Um, but I don't know whether I will modify that or just stick to it. So that we can also hear the woman's voice, you know. Um, and then think of the of the new ring and the sweet 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 dreams. <laughs> Alright, so uh, please over to you. One minute as much as possible. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, say to our first uh, speaker that uh, uh, I have a question. I, 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 I put it out that we we uh, we praise the the modern uh, cell phone and things like that. I know it's useful in certain cir circumstances, but I wish that Africa, the, the, the new Africa, will keep its humanity. This is why I want to go to Africa because of its humanity. Second of all. Um, there's also, uh, uh, there, there, you, you talked about voluntary uh, lecturers. Well, if you think that I could be a lecturer, I would be, I would be pleased to go. And second of all, uh, Chila, I come from a mining area, and there is danger in the mines. I will invite her to come to my region to, to explain what she's doing. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Now, on to Mr. Uh, Dr. Pius here, who doesn't know how to count. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I called you right, the first I, I name. I am sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it'll be short. Um, uh, okay, so, um, first of all, you're talking about fast food, uh, which takes 15 minutes in France. Uh, it takes uh, about 10 hours to prepare a meal. But this is a question of mathematics. You will have to accept mathematics, my friend. It's part of everything. Okay. Yeah, I just I just don't want you. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll take uh, okay. the questions then. Well, that's it. That's okay. all I have to say. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Okay, all right, thanks. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank you again for having this opportunity to ask this question. My name is Sunil. I really like the fact that you talk about culture, and uh, one of the the two things I want to focus on. One of the things that we fail in is keeping time as Africans. It's a culture. It's a cultural thing. Mm. You are trying to push for that. So I would like us to actually really critically think about that as, a, as, as, as Africans, that time is money. And uh, so I want, I want to agree on that. Secondly, we also have a culture of corruption. And that is really entrenched into our our society. Uh, I don't know about most places you cannot do anything without paying anyone. So I want us to try to maybe shed some light on what you guys are thinking of, of addressing those two key issues. Okay, we'll take care. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jean-Marie Chishahayo. I'm, I'm Senior Advisor Coordinator for UN Habitat and uh, Universal Order. We have actually a similar coming conference uh, in October on Chan Africa Sustainable Urbanization. So I welcome everybody, those who were able to, to contact me for that conference. I'd like also to congratulate uh, University of Carlton and uh, all the diplomats who have been really make this a success. Um, 
the last 15 years I've been on China Africa program. Uh, I have seen poverty in China from the beginning to the time really country puts a good plan to the time now the country is very developed now. And the vision they have ahead, we have a lot of to learn. If I look at um, uh, this African Agenda 2063, we have a lot of ahead really to learn from planning and developing. It's not to talk today because this is the last point. But the key issue today we have and develop is really where Africa is moving. <clears throat> Most of developing countries are moving into fast urbanizations. We are jumping from industrialization to urbanization economy. <clears throat> Africa is no more really getting GDP from really industrialization. We are really on urbanizations. It's not in Africa, many countries. That's where really future is going. And then uh, I'd like to really let everybody really focus more how this is going to transform. Uh, come back to uh, the first speaker talking about science and technology. That's where we need really African experts really uh, to be more focused, really educated, really those uh, science and technology and those to come on innovation and competitiveness. So um, the key issue now is to see if diaspora, we, we know highly educated people from Africa are brain drained from developed countries. We're in a, in a head hunting uh, and brain drained international system where someone highly educated you, we don't have a space, you can walk wherever you want. So African countries are hard time just to keep these high talent people uh, to go back. Uh, China, Sam, I think the last week I was talking about how really they managed to bring diaspora back. I wish Africa can work really on a very strategic framework so that it can have all these uh, expert diaspora to be more participating with a very good agenda. We don't have this agenda here, that's why many expect that still really outside of their continent. This is where science and technology plus really government have to work on this agenda. Uh, it's open questions, uh, it doesn't mean that someone can answer or it's just a comment. To be sure, this vision 2063 is going to be practical and really bring the best Africa is looking for the future. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. You know, um, BIOS, African Union, my definition to African Union is a club of dictators who meets in Addis every year, back up their bars to keep oppress their own citizen. All right, my comment, I have two comments. One comment is about the, uh, we need to sit together BIOS with a group of the African diplomats and see maybe we could come up with some policy on the diaspora, not a uh, brain, drain that a brain gain. And I think one of the challenge for us, we need to sit together and uh, some, some of us who are in the area of the academia may be able to come up with some policy. But the issue come back again, how do we implement it? Because diaspora in most African countries are not welcome. Why? Because the leadership thinks that the diaspora is going to take off their jobs. Uh, that's the issue. We need to work on that. Um, with regards to the time, September 11 will never happen in Africa. You know why? <laughs> September 11, it never happened in Africa. When you go with your bomb to Africa, airports, plane never leaves on time. For two days, three days, you ended up going home anyway. So I think we in the diaspora, we, in the diaspora, we should keep time. But if in Africa they don't want to keep time, this is their problem. But we should be able to stick with the time. Because it's an essence as well uh, emphasize. Why our young kids in uh, North America are not uh, connected so, to Africa. Sorry. This, yeah. this is my last one. Please. Yes, please. Because Africa is all of horrible news about killing, hunger, and so forth. My uh, children's, my children, my sister's kids in New York call the mother, say, "Mom, come and see your people are dying in South Sudan. Come, <laughs> come and see your people dying in South Sudan." <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, two quick questions, maybe the answers could be long, but first, to me, culture is part of your own identity, and it's, it's, it's fundamental, so how could Africa, toward, with the Africa 2063 plan, better, better leverage this and better um, brand and market its own, uh, its own culture? I think it's, it should be really part of the Africa. 2063 agenda. Uh, that was one. The second one, we haven't didn't have time to talk a lot about peace and security and conflicts, but I've always 
question myself, you know, I, I mean, men and women can do the best and can do the worst in life, and why not try to use the culture and music and all that to actually, among other things, but, you know, to help uh, reunite peoples and, and, and bring peace. So if you study culture, I mean, what could be the impact of culture on peace and security? All right, thank you very much. Um, so the questions have justified my brutality in trying to keep the time because um, the vote of thanks, the wrap up ought to have been um, by 4.15 and uh, we had done pretty well getting the time and then um, I think that on that note, um, some of the questions appear really open and most of it are comments. I will um, ask uh, the speakers, you know, to respond appropriately so that in the spirit of time, uh, we can have the wrap up on time. Thank you. So, um, I like to start in reverse order. That way, I'll put the piles under pressure. Oh, so, okay. I, are you responding? Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky because close. everything that was directed at me, they're just, they're, they're very perceptive comments and really, I, I wouldn't even like to add or take away from, you know, of course I would have to accept mathematics, you know, that's an advice that um, I'm taking very seriously. But I just, what, 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 but my critique is uh, a certain pattern of behavior across the continent, which rather than see the linkages, the critical linkages between, um, between the, you know, between the sciences, between mathematics and all that and, 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 and culture, there are too many policies official which actually create a false dichotomy between, uh, and so you have a, a, a certain aversion uh, for what I call the, the software language of the arts and culture and a preference for the hardware language of, um, of, of, of the sciences. It's completely false. They reinforce each other and we have to uh, start critically thinking through. I'm going to give you, because I actually went through, I, I, I did give examples and recommendations and all that in this. So it's, um, it's a very pertinent point. You know, we need to think more in terms of how they feed uh, into each other so that somebody like me could go to many of these conferences and talks and uh, not have to entertain, but, you know, have uh, more. Actually, Chinua you know, Achebe also has an essay like that when he was invited to, uh, by the World Bank to a meeting in Paris. And he said he wondered what he was doing there uh, because the World Bank types, everybody came and made their pronouncements with statistics and figures and data, growth, development. Uh, I, I know those keywords, you know, yeah, I can just bring them out of my pocket. And then he was, what has things for a got to do with all, oh, maybe they need a novel, a novel is to entertain them, you know, after all the hard facts. So we, we don't, it's that attitude that I'm saying that. Uh, we must, we must change. Um, were you okay? Well, just no. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. No, we no, can't. Uh, we'll continue it after, and then the only the other thing I want to address is um is uh, Lily's Lily's just one point, one quick correction. There's a difference between uh, a perversion of culture. Which, which becomes routinized and generalized and acquires the appearance of a culture. So we don't have a culture of corruption. Culture is who you are, is who you are about, your values and all that. Uh, and I'm sure you know it exists everywhere, but we have perverted it. We have, uh, to the extent that some people even make try to make comparisons between the African African values and you know of gifts and all that, so that when they take bribes, it's like my culture is you know is, it will be understood as gift and all that. So it's a perversion of it, and that's why we need institutions, institutions and the political willpower to take care of that problem. But it's, some of us have gone as far as thinking that maybe it may not be a bad idea to look to look in the direction of what the Chinese and the Koreans do when they see corruption. You know, it's like, it's almost the death penalty, you know, I know that. So it's not our culture, it's a perversion of our culture. And there, is, there isn't just enough institutional strength and political willpower at the moment, but I'm sure we'll get there. All right, thank you.
Thank you. Um, so I'm sorry, I just had to abridge uh, any back and forth um, so that we can wrap up. Yes, please, um, Irene. Okay. Um, I just want to say um, I totally uh, understand where Dr. Pio Sadesani is coming from. And I just want to reassure him that he doesn't need to to fight at the people who <laughs> put the numbers and throw punches at them. But we do need to collaborate. We need to work exactly. together. Exactly. So, yes, we do acknowledge that culture is important and aims in its own way. Is embracing that, and if you go to an, I invite any of you, if you go to any of the countries where we've got institutes, do go along and, and visit an institute, and you will see that we embrace the wider aspects of African culture. We've got people who come from Muslim countries, we've got people who are vegetarian, and we make sure every student, no matter from what part of Africa they come, when they arrive at an AIM student, they feel safe, they feel comfortable, they feel that their needs are taken care of. This is how we start making little inroads to embrace the wider diversity in the continent. And over time, as we generate more people who go through that training, one day we will achieve that vision. Those aspirations in 2063 will become a reality because we've seen it work in miniature. And I'd just like to wrap up by saying I thank the organizers again once more because I think science, technology, innovation, mathematics, is really key. We really, really need to empower our youth. The youth are the future. We've all got children. Most of us around the room, if we don't have a child, we've got a sister who's got a child. We, we all have young ones coming up. What, what, what legacy do we want to leave for them? We want to be able to, you know, some of us might be lucky in a lifetime, we see some of these bigger tran transformations. But we're already seeing hope that things are changing, and we hope they change in the right direction. So we want the youth to embrace this and make them realize that it's within their reach. You know, we want to go beyond the state where we get a lot of expatriates coming into Africa, working in all the big multinationals, and when the job is done, they all leave, and where are we? We go back to the farms. We want to be able to start absorbing some of those skills, so we start addressing some of the home challenges that we have. You know, this is what AIM students are doing. They are looking at uh, causes of malaria, causes of HIV. They are doing a lot of modeling, trying to find out solutions to some of these issues in Africa. Antoine, I mentioned, is actually working in oil and gas. And his idea is trying to find out how best to explore oil and gas on the continent. And some of these developments will not be unique just for Africa. It will be relevant for the whole wide world. So on a societal level, what AIMS is doing is really making sure the impact is felt both at the individual level and institutional level and society as a whole. All right. Um, thank you so much. It looks um, like everything was um, so mathematically planned from the beginning. Um, as you can see, it's a very high note to end um, a conversation between culture and science. Um, I think that it too would always go hand in gloves, um, especially as the weather is warming up. Um, thank you so much, uh, presenters, and then thank you, the audience, um, on behalf of the East of African Studies. And um, as you will note, and I think it's important that we emphasize it, this has been a collaborative um, initiative and um, the various um, sectors that have put in effort within a short time to make this successful is a testimony to the kind of unity uh, that we need in the continent in order to drive the continent forward. Um, we thank all of you and on that note I would invite uh, the Vice Dean of the African Diplomatic Corps, Ottawa, uh, His Excellency Solomon Azo Mbi. Uh, the High Commissioner of Cameroon to Canada. Is he here? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I was wondering the way you were looking back. <laughs> for a moment, I, I thought you were searching for somebody else. Um, to give the vote of thanks, and if you need any modification, I'm very glad to accommodate that. Yes. 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 They say yes. 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 <laughs> but popular demand. Yeah. This is democracy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, <laughs> I have a colleague in the university here who had worked for a very long while in, in the continent, and he's, he's a Canadian. And he is in the habit of saying, when we have meetings, and I really admire that, or that as much as possible we're going to avoid voting because um, in African meetings we reach decisions by consensus. <laughs> and this is very obvious. So I think this is an affirmation of the important role that, um, that we have played together. Um, to get it. So we're happy to have her make their remarks. Je ne veux pas dépasser une minute. C'est juste vous remercier ces conférenciers, professeur Blair. Le groupe africain, le, le, la UDEF, notre association, les invités d'avoir répondu massivement et d'avoir participé pour que euh, la discussion soit effective, pour que nous puissions partager euh, les différentes euh, discussions. Euh, vous avez euh, entendu, vous avez pu comprendre que l'Afrique euh, a beaucoup de choses à partager avec euh, tout le monde. Et puis nous avons beaucoup d'opportunités euh, avec euh, euh, l'agenda la, 2063. Quand on dit l'agenda 2063, on dirait que c'est vraiment c'est très long, mais euh, c'est juste... Euh, il y a beaucoup de choses là-dedans. On ne peut pas, euh, on ne peut pas euh, terminer euh, en une seconde, en une minute. Mais c'est beaucoup de choses euh, et c'est très intéressant euh, d'avoir euh, mis sur le programme euh, cet ce, cette, euh, cette agenda 2063 pour qu'on puisse... Euh, ça, pour pour qu'on puisse savoir, pour qu'on puisse comprendre ce qui se fait dans notre continent. Euh, C'est euh, juste vous remercier. Euh, je ne croyais pas qu'ici il y a non averti. Alors, euh, <rire> j'ai compris que ça peut, euh, ça peut être non averti à l'école secondaire. On, quand on donnait non averti, c'est que c'était vraiment très, très difficile de répondre à, à différentes questions. Euh, je, je remercie très infiniment aux conférenciers, aux modérateurs, à tout le monde qui a contribué pour que cette discussion soit effective. Merci beaucoup et bon Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Je vais vous dire ce que le docteur Dessomé a juste dit. Il a dit que je suis en train de me dire que je suis en train de me dire que je suis en train de me dire a moderator. That's why he calls um, African scholars who speak only one, one, one international. <laughs> um, on that note, yes, uh, we'll have uh, the wrap up, and I would just wish that um, you could add patterns of um, African one African language, you know, um, so that we can hear our tongue too from Cameroon. Um, it's, it's a solicitation. You don't have to do that anyway. <laughs> Please, a round of applause for his excellency. Thank you. I'll be very brief then. Bravo. And um, I just wanted to uh, indicate that uh, this over the last few days, uh, there have been a number of uh, events. Uh, celebrating the contributions and especially the leadership, underscoring the leadership role of women uh, around the world. We had one profiling women from the Arab world and one women of Canada. Uh, today, uh, the African women diplomats have demonstrated leadership and vision. In organizing this conference, uh, centered around the development vision for Africa uh, to Agenda 2063. 
this morning, we listen to a soul-stirring and stimulating opening address by Honorable Lois Brown, a, a great friend of Africa, uh, who, from her own empirical experience, uh, showed the connections between Canada's foreign policy objectives in Africa to the AU's Agenda 2063. Then we had, of course, a very incisive um, uh, analysis from our colleague, His Excellency Sule Gariba, the High Commissioner of Ghana, who basically uh, demonstrated that Africa's ambitions for the next 50 years are fueled and propelled by the failings and frustrations of the last 50 years. Uh, failings and frustrations that contrast sharply with the phenomenal strides and successes observed in other parts of the world. Uh, I'm sure that throughout the day, you must have all realized that there is a rude awakening in Africa to the need for change. And in Africa, perhaps more than elsewhere, it is well known and well understood that when the song changes, the dance steps change also. In the three panels that followed, uh, participants delved into specific aspects of the dream for a new Africa as brilliant speaker after brilliant speaker made illuminating presentations uh, highlighting the ambitions of the changing African continent but also the challenges that must be overcome with the continent is to outpace itself and keep pace with the rest of the changing world. Uh, John H. Clark said the purpose of setting goals is to inspire action, not predict it. It's to inspire action, not predict it. The AU's Agenda 2063 sets out ambitious goals requiring conscious and committed action from Africans themselves. Uh, that is why we've had this discussion today. Um, uh, the three panels that were created uh, delved into specific aspects of that vision. The importance of science and technology uh, was highlighted, and we're particularly happy and pleased to have had a representative of AIMS, uh, AIM6, to promote the development of science and technology as the very underpinnings of for transformative change in Africa. Um, Africa, AU is about 50 years and is looking at, at the next 50 years. So we're somewhere in the middle age, around 50. Uh, somebody, Andrew, John Andrew Holmes, has reckoned that at middle age, the soul should be opening up like a rose and not closing up like a cabbage. At 50, the soul should be opening up as a rose and not closing up like a cabbage. A rose and a cabbage, indeed. Africa has both. And I'm sure throughout the very illuminating ex, uh, ex presentations and discussions this afternoon, you realize that Africa is opening up as a rose. Hopefully then, uh, as we rise from this conference, I'm sure you will leave with a number of lessons, salient lessons. You've certainly, I wouldn't go back into that, but certainly you will go with lessons concerning Africa's compelling history, but definitely also on Africa's colorful heritage. Uh, you will have lessons, we will leave with lessons concerning the challenges that are in Africa, but definitely lessons about the chances, the opportunities that are in Africa. And hopefully you've had an occasion through this conference 
to learn something about the hype, but also the hope associated with Africa. It is increasingly recognized that Africa's time has come, that it is good to be in Africa, good to invest and do business in Africa, and particularly good to be African these days. As African heads of mission, accredited to Canada, one of the leading powers in the world, this is our message to Canada and to the world. There is a new Africa seeking meaningful partnership with the rest of the world for peace, progress, and prosperity. I conclude these closing remarks by calling on my colleagues, very, very modest. They are, but they are eminent, eminent personalities. I call on the women of the African Diplomatic Forum, AUDIF, to please rise to be recognized. Kingdom of Lesotho, and you have the ambassador from the seat of Africa itself, Ethiopia. You have the ambassador of Rwanda, and you have the Burundi. Oh, Burundi, I'm sorry. Burundi. The, the one for Rwanda is out here. And you have, of course, the uh, deputy head of mission for uh, Uganda. The others are not here. But uh, can, I think it is thanks to their vision and leadership that we've had this most informative and successful conference. There is flattery in friendship between Shakespeare's name, but I'm sure there's no flattery if I ask you to join me in congratulating And of course, we congratulate all the eminent speakers, the panelists, the participants, members of the media who helped to make this conference, and of course, the Institute of African Studies very ably created, birthed, birthed by Professor Rutherford here. Please, we want to thank you for all what you're doing for Africa, for Carleton University, for this institute, and for the world. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we claim that very beautiful uh, remarks for the power of culture and of the humanities. <laughs> we have to that. Uh, and on that note, oh, we have a, I think, uh, there's a presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just before we have the presentation, um, there is uh, the man who has sat quietly through it all, but who has been a powerhouse for this event who has sat quietly and almost uh, beyond the quietly. And we'll just let him go like that. He has to bid us farewell. Uh, he knows himself and he's looking at me so intently, wondering what I'm doing. And he is um, the man to whom the last remarks were made um, as they were closing His Excellency. Uh, we'll bring on behalf of Carlton University, um, once the presentation has been made, to bid us farewell, and we'll invite um, after that Professor Blair Rutherford um, after this um, to bid us farewell as our chief host for the event. Thank you. You ready? Thank you. 
Excellencies, um, Ambassadors and High Commissioners of Protocol Observed, ladies and gentlemen, Audif has got uh, a tradition of giving presents to presenters and moderators at our events. So that's what we would like to do. And uh, I would like to start with, I have a sneaking and uncomfortable feeling that I'm going to mispronounce some people's names. I do not mean to offend, and I just hope and pray that you'll be able to recognize your names <laughs> and come up for your presence. Um, I'll start with Dr. Rosian Ro Rant, 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 President of Carlton University. I, I think she couldn't stay for that. She's, yeah. she's not okay. Okay, we, I could, I could for those who are not here, we shall keep their presence and deliver them uh, later on. Uh, Dr. Moses Chibundu, that one I'm not going to mispronounce. It's very familiar. He made. He had to. He had to teach this afternoon. Okay, uh, Dr. Teddy Sami of African Studies, Carlton. Looks like most people have gone home. Uh, Miss Louise Omet. <laughs> so, Johnny Takanyasi. Honorable Susan Nakauchi. Otiono, I almost called him Otieno. I was no, trying to right. make him East African. Oh, well, at least that's the reason you got it so well. Otiono. <laughs> does not give presents to members of the African diplomatic group because they are part of us and we are part of them. It would be like giving ourselves <laughs> presents. But we would like to appreciate the High Commissioner for Ghana very much for the presentation. For the Thank you very much. Oh, 
I would like to thank the countries that uh, contributed their gifts, Ethiopia, Lesotho, Egypt, Uganda, Burundi, <laughs> Nigeria, Madagascar, and Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, and uh, because you've been so patient, um, we are finally having uh, Professor Blair on the phone. And then thank you for first, we wish we could give you some presents too. <laughs> but you have our gratitude. And then um, on that note, I would invite uh, Professor Rutherford um, just to, um, yeah. It would be very quick because uh, we had some very eloquent words from uh, the, His Excellency, the High Commissioner from Cameroon. Uh, I just want to thank everyone again, our co-organizers uh, who made this happen. Uh, I also want to let you know that the videos will be up on our uh, YouTube channel, the video of the conference, probably within a week or so. Uh, and we're going to talk to the speakers and see if they have papers or presentations which we can share as well. And I also want to thank some volunteers, uh, student volunteers from undergraduate and graduate, uh, including Sarah who's been patiently uh, filming this all, but also who's been rapporteurs, who've been taking notes of the presentations which will share with the diplomatic community, but also, if, if fine, we'll put it up on our, our website as well. Um, just a, a final note, uh, you know, this is, uh, as, as you may know, there's many events going on uh, concerning Africa and African diaspora in the Ottawa uh, Gatineau community. Uh, we, we, like, we, not only at our university, but University of Ottawa, a number of NGOs, number of African-Canadian community groups, uh, if, if you don't know already, we have a list serve that sends out information once a week about these upcoming events, as well as academic calls for papers and, and our own institute news. So if you, if you want to you know, keep, keep on top of, of you know, some of the many events going on in, in our community, uh, please let me know. I'd be happy to add your, your email to it. Uh, with that, thank you so much for your participation. And uh, until next time. Congratulations. Hey, thank you.